book of Matthew. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the present, the past, and the future from a biblical New Testament uh, vantage point. Last week, we talked a little bit about the um, wiles of the devil. Last week, we talked about we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices, okay? For those who were with us, <coughs> Joey and <coughs> Raymond weren't with us last week, but uh, we understand. But uh, that's kind of what we talked about last week. Specifically, we were talking about... Specifically, we're talking about, anybody? Wearing out of the saints, okay? That's what we're talking about. One of the tricks of the enemy is to try to wear the saints down. And what happens in the wearing out process is the wearing out process doesn't last, doesn't, doesn't, uh, uh, it occurs over time, okay? If your faith is strong, the enemy is trying to, wear it out and uh, it's 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 something that we need to recognize is that the wearing out but today we're going to talk about something that uh, is, is is I believe very interesting and it's the way that God deals with man uh, you know it's important for us to understand is that the heart of man hasn't changed from the from the garden all the way till now you know, we have uh, uh, technology, we have a lot of things that have changed over the last hundred plus years have changed. Things have changed in our lifetime more than any other generation, uh, except maybe Noah's generation. There's been a lot of change, a lot of change, and we think it's been that way all the time, and if you really understand it, it hasn't. Things have changed tremendously. But in the midst of all the change that's going on, the Bible stands true because the Bible understands the heart of man. And if you look at the 10th verse of the 13th chapter, you, you, you see the disciples asking Jesus a question. And it says, the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Somebody tell me what's going on. Set the scene for me, please. What's going on? I'm looking at John and not paying attention to you guys. He's yeah, John says, right on time, John. You guys, you and Yolanda, are right on time. Yeah, no, don't blame it on her, dude. That's, that's, you're not going to get away with that anymore. What's going on in the 13th chapter? Somebody kind of set the scene for me a little bit. Anybody? Huh? He's teaching them. Yes, man, he's teaching them. He's, he's, he's teaching his disciples, you know what I mean? He's got the disciples. What you have to understand is that, is that in, every, in every group, you, you have the same the situation that Jesus had. Jesus is out there teaching, and who's around? Number one, the religious leaders are always around looking. Uh, uh, also, the multitude is out of there, okay? From the multitude comes the disciples. You know, they're always drawn out of the multitude, and they come, and then the last group are the apostles that are always right there around him. And wherever Jesus went, whether it was in Galilee, whether it was in Jerusalem, you can almost bet that the, that the religious leaders were there, that the multitude was there, that the disciples were there, and that the apostles were right along with him because Jesus is preparing the disciples, including the apostles. Jesus is preparing them, and he knows he only has a certain amount of time, and he has to get these guys on the right track because they're going to change the world. <laughs> these guys, a bunch of nobodies from nowhere, and they're going to change the world. But here's, here's what's going on. Jesus is teaching... And how is he teaching? What, what method is he using to teach the people that are there? Parables, okay? What is a parable? Look at this, this group right over here. This is my A squad right over here, right there. Those two over there. They, 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 boom, okay? A, a, a parable is what? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus has been using this form of teaching in this chapter and in this situation, this environment that we find ourselves in. And once again, what is a parable? A parable is, number one, an earthly story 
with a heavenly meaning. And the disciples come to him and they ask him, why are you doing it that way? What do you think their concern was? The people weren't getting it. The people weren't understanding it. So the, the disciples, the apostles, they're looking at the multitude and the religious leaders. And Jesus is talking about farming and he's talking about fishing and he's talking about weather. He's talking about everyday regular events and using that earthly story and translating it spiritually. And the disciples come to him and say, why are you teaching them in parables? Because they're not getting it. But let me tell you what, a parable is one of the basic forms of teaching. A parable is something that you use that everybody understands. If I talked about driving and used driving and, and then translated it into a spiritual uh, uh, lesson, all of us would understand about driving, okay? Let's say that I started talking about, and, and I know none of you do this except me, okay? Because you guys are just so holy and so obedient to the law. But do you realize that there's people out there that try to read their phone and text at the same time while they're driving? Do you know anybody like that? Huh? There's people that actually do that. I've caught myself a couple of times doing that. Going down I-25 on the way to Santa Fe. And all of a sudden, ding dong. I just have to look at it. I mean, I'm so important. I mean, that has to be something. So then I, so I can't wait. Oh, you know what? Sometimes I'm going to put you in the back row one of these days is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a glass, the glass room back in over there, okay? I used, to work, I used to work at the theater when I was a kid. I used to work at the, at the drive-in theater during the summer, and the indoor theater was owned by the same people. And they used to have a glass, door, a glass room in the back. I don't know if anybody remembers this. That was the cry room. Whenever the babies cried, they put them back in the back room over there. She's not a baby, but I'm going to get in trouble anyway. So, uh, so if I started talking about text, and, and there I am, and I pick up my phone, and I start looking at it, and then all of a sudden, what happens? You're getting off the road, brother. Now, yeah. what have I used? And then I can start talking about, is it possible for us as uh, Christians that we can get out of our lane every once in a while? Can we get off track? And what have I used? I've used an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So here's, here's the point. The point is, is that the disciples are coming to Jesus and says, why are you teaching them in parables? Well, how do you want me to teach them? Well, how do you want to teach them? He says, why are you teaching them basic math? Because they're definitely not going to understand algebra, geometry, and some of the other applied sciences that are out there. They ain't going to get it. It's, it's funny that they ask the question because the question is really something. So Jesus goes on and says, listen, uh, it's because he answered them and said to him, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not be given. Do you think if he talked about the mysteries of heaven without using an earthy that the disciples would have got it? I, I think part of the reason is, is the disciples were saying, well, I don't even understand it. I can tell the look of the people. They're not getting it either. The beautiful thing was one of these days the disciples were going to get it. When the Spirit of God came in the second chapter of Pentecost, all of a sudden, a switch was going to be turned in them, and they were going to get it. That's how important the Holy Spirit is in our lives, and for us to honor the Holy Spirit and what God is doing. But parable is just a basic form of teaching. It's a very, here's something that Isaiah said. Isaiah said uh, God said in Isaiah, how shall I teach this people? How is it that I'm going to teach these people? How is it? Here's how I'll teach these people. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. He was, he was saying pretty much the same thing that's going on right here in the 13th chapter. He says, this is how I'm going to teach I'm going to teach them like little kids. Okay? Mamas, you know how you do this. You know how you teach your kids. 
You teach them little, yeah, you go, and you go over it again, and you go over it again, and you go over it again. And, the, 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 and, and, the, and, and God in the Old Testament says, how am I going to teach Israel? He says, I'm going to teach them line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And you read that on the outset, and it sounds, well, that's pretty deep. No, it wasn't deep at all. It says, listen, we got to go back to the elementary schools. We got to go back to first grade. We got to go back to repetition over and over and over again. God is always trying to bring a, a revelation. Everybody say revelation. God is trying to bring revelation into our lives. God is invested in bringing revelation, and revelation is the uncovering of the hidden things. Here he's trying to bring an uncovering. What is he trying? What is this basic topic here in the 13th chapter of Matthew? What has been his basic topic since he started his earthly ministry? The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And if you look at the parables, almost every parable in the Bible starts off talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like, and it's like, and it's like, and it's like. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to uncover. He's trying to unveil the kingdom. And he's, there's the apostles. There's the disciples. There's the multitude. There's the religious leaders. And he's speaking to them in a very simple way. Not everybody's getting it. I tell you, Nicodemus didn't get it in the third chapter of John. See, Jesus, once again, he uses an earthly story to convey a spiritual truth. What was the earthly topic that Nicodemus, that Jesus used in, in the third chapter when he was talking to Nicodemus? Born again. He says, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus was, was thinking over here, and Jesus was talking over here. And, and, and Nicodemus even says, well, how can I get back into my mother's womb? And, and Nick, he says, Nick, you don't get it, buddy. You don't get it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to take you up. I'm and I believe God is always trying to take us up, and, how, and he's trying to do that to all humanity. But here we have the, 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 the multitudes, and Jesus is trying to teach them in a very basic form in a very easy to understand process and guess what goes right over their head it's always been this way it's always been this way ain't going to change See, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. You understand what, what, what I'm talking about? You really want to know what I'm talking about? He says, you must be born again. The problem with the multitude is that they were not. That's the problem. And until we come to that place in our life is to we allow God. You know, I was looking at a scripture. In fact, we were going over it this week in the 12th chapter of the book of John. In the 12th pack chapter, I'm pretty sure it's in the 12th chapter, is to where it says that many of the religious leaders believed in Jesus, but they were not willing to confess him because they were afraid of, of their... Excuse me? They're not there, just their life. They're afraid of their other people that were around them. Okay? They're, they're afraid that, you know, hey, you know, how many, how many people, how many people say, say I believe in Jesus, but I, I can't say it out loud. I believe in Jesus, but I can't. And see, that was, the, that was the heart of the, so I tell you what, God is trying to bring revelation, and God is always trying to speak into our lives. God is speaking. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1 says that God has spoken to us by the prophets, but now he speaks to us by the Son. And who's trying to do is say, I'm trying to speak into your lives. I'm trying to bring understanding into your life. How many of you want understanding in your life? How many of you want to know what God is saying today in your life? God is speaking. Listen, God speaks through different ways. God speaks through the circumstances. God is speaking today in the circumstances. God speaks through, through, through human beings. 
God speaks through His Word. God through, speaks through that still, small voice. God speaks through dreams, visions. God will try to penetrate into our life any way that He can and to give us understanding. And if it takes a simple form, like a parabolic form, to be able to, to, to break into our lives, God will try to use that. But it's nothing that's new. It's nothing you can say, well, it, that, that was then. That was those people, you know. We're smarter now. We look at our kids today, and here is you get a, a kid that's barely a few months old, and he's already doing this, and, and, and he's swiping right and swiping left and, and hitting buttons. And, and you say, man, the dude can barely talk. What the heck's he doing all those things? I say, these kids, they sure are smart today, man. They sure are smart today. You know what? They're just regular old human beings. Just regular. And, and, the, and the heart of man has always been the same. That is, that was the present in New Testament times. Let's go to the book of Amos. I believe it's the book of Amos that I need to go back. And, and uh, if my computer here will, what's your problem, son? Come back to the, there you go. I had to almost reboot my computer right over there. Uh, uh, Amos chapter 8. I want you to look at something. This, that's not too far. It's not too far from from where we were in Matthew chapter 13. Why? Because the heart of man is always the same. But not only is the heart of man the same, the desire of God does not change either. God wants to speak. God wants to, 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 to uncover. God wants to prepare us. God wants to, 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 to encourage us and to build us up in his word all the time. And sometimes you can be sitting there and thinking that we're talking in a foreign language when we're not. That was the multitude's fault. The multitude's fault was, hey, he, look at the bird. Wait a minute, Jesus is talking, man. Jesus is giving me revelation. I never noticed that tree. What kind of a tree? No, hey, hey. The heart of man has always been the same. In the time of Jesus, trying to speak to the people, trying to bring revelation unto their lives. I look at verse 11 real quick, but, and then I'm going to set this up for you. Verse 11 says, Behold, the days are coming. See, the Father is speaking to Israel. He's speaking to his covenant people in the 11th verse of the 8th chapter of Amos. He's speaking to his people and he's telling them through the prophet Amos. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's an interesting scripture. Do we have it up there? Yeah, look at, we got it up there. He says, look at what's, oh, 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 what's the father saying? What is, what, is, what, is, what is God saying through Amos? He says, there's coming a time. He said, dude, I don't know if it's, I don't know, I don't know. That's, you're getting a little deep for me now, you lie. I don't know, man. He, huh? he, says, he says, the days are coming, things are coming. He says that a famine is coming. He said, oh, a famine's coming. You better, you better buy more food. You better buy the freeze-dried food and food and put it in the, in the ground or have some secret place to it. Let, let's all become a bunch of preppers. And God says, no, 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 no. That's not the famine that's coming. The famine is what? For hearing, he says, for hearing the word. See, it's not that there's going to be a lack of word. It's going to be that there is a lack of, of hearing the word. They're rejecting, they're, 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 you know, they're so caught up in the things of this world. That's why we have to understand that we have a place called Goshen. That's why we have to understand is that when, when the, 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 the Israelites were in Egypt, that they had a, a place that was set apart for them that was called Goshen. And it was the most fertile land in all of Egypt. And they had this place that was their place. And that's where they, in the midst of the world, they had their part of the kingdom of God that was there. The kingdom of God had been established in Goshen. And here we are later. 
generations later in the time of Amos. Let me set up the history for the time of Amos. After Solomon had died, his son took over as the king. And there was another man who rose up who didn't like Solomon's son, who didn't think he was going to be a big leader, so he split off half of the nation. That's where we get the northern and the southern kingdom from. Amos is talking to the northern kingdom. Amos is talking to a people who are separated. Do you realize there's a division in our country now? I don't think it takes anybody to figure out that there's a division in our country right now. They don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. There's a big break. There's a big split, you know. The, that, that, middle, that middle ground isn't populated so much here, you know. People are picking sides. Take it to, I won't say the left or the right, because they'll say, well, which one are you on? And where do you believe? I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. That's who I am. That, that's, I, I stand for, for the king is what I want to stand for. Do you realize that? Do you understand that? But here is Amos. Amos is speaking to a divided nation. He's speaking to the northern kingdom. And he tells them this. He says, the days are coming. God is telling me that he's going to send a famine. You're going to, there's going to be a famine in the land. They called the land Samaria. That's where the Samarians come from and the mixed race and all this stuff. Long story that was over there. But, but Amos is speaking to these people. And what these people have done is these people have split off from Judea where Jerusalem was and they have set up their own temples and they finally have even set up their own gods. They're not worshiping the God of Moses or of David or of Abraham anymore. They are worshiping the God Baal. Baal was the devil incarnate. Baal was the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of light. And these people had been so overtaken by the worship of Baal that they had completely separated themselves, not just in their physical, not just in their mind, but in their spirit they had separated themselves away from God completely. And God says, I'm going to send a famine in the land. See, the famine in the land was on the multitude. The famine in the land was on the 13th chapter when the people really weren't getting it. Did God want them to get it? Ask the question for me, please. Did God want them to get it in the 13th chapter of Matthew? Huh? Of course he did. I mean, he, uh, he sends his only begotten son, born of a virgin, living a sinless life, full of the Holy Spirit, to speak into their lives. Did God want them to get it? Listen, listen. We cannot allow spiritual ignorance to come into our lives. We cannot let the things these people had allowed, so, because what it is, the drifting, it's like we talked about this the last couple of weeks. It's like that boat that you, that you untie from the pier. What happens with that boat that you, cut the, that you cut the rope? What happens with that boat after a while? Starts drifting away. And a little by little, little by little. Well, it's not going too far. Give it a while. One of these days, you won't be able to swim out there to get to that boat. One of these days, you won't even be able to see that boat. And that's what happens is we allow spiritual ignorance to come into our lives. Listen, these were covenant people in the time of Jesus, in the present biblical New Testament times. They were covenant people. They, and the Old Testament in the time of Avon, still the same. They are covenant people. They are God's people that he has set apart. They were the ones whose forefathers were in Goshen. They were, the, the, their forefathers had been in the, in the wilderness. Their forefathers had crossed over with Joshua into them. And, but still the problem is the same. Yes, sir.
morning. When all of a sudden...